Okay. Okay, that's just important. Great. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andy. It's a great, great pleasure to be here today. Um, it's it's been really exciting uh, to be visiting you. I think you know the living links together with the Budongo Trail. I think they have great potential. It is very, um, very moving to see both the University of St Andrews and other universities in Scotland and the zoo cooperating an enterprise like this. This is something really important, I think, and, and I would like to show my appreciation for for, for having the vision to engage in this kind of cooperation. I would like to start with a cartoon, a cartoon that was published in a paper in, in the 50s by a very uh, prominent comparative psychologist. And uh, the cartoon is meant to be a critique of the comparative psychology that was being done at the time. And here the critique is that comparative psychologists were focusing too much on rats. So you can see here the rat is leading the scientists, the comparative psychologist in this case to the river is, you know, this is taken of course from the, the, uh, the piper from uh, Hamelin. Things have changed and now we study more species and we, uh, the field has become more diverse. But when you for instance look at the, at the studies that have been done in apes, you still see that there are some imbalances. Uh, when you look at the four great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and bonobos, most of the studies by far have been done uh, with chimpanzees, which means that in a sense we still have that old problem. This is data that is based, this data that you see here is based on a survey of a number of, uh, of uh, journals during this period from 78 to 2007 and looking at things, uh, topics on, on cognition and uh, technical cognition and social cognition. So now if, if you keep in mind those data that I showed you a minute ago, the picture <coughs> could be something like this. It's the chimpanzee who is leading the, uh, the comparative psychologist to the river. The Wolfgang Fuller Primate Research Center was an attempt to change that situation, was an attempt to study not just chimpanzees, which is very important. I am not saying, please don't understand, the, understand this, it's not saying stop studying chimpanzees. What I th the, the message I would like to convey is very important to study other species, and it is very, um, um, very good to see uh, that here in Edinburgh, both monkeys and chimpanzees are being studied. This is, this is exactly what we need. So in Leipzig, we study chimpanzees, but we also study bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. And we study those species to answer questions about behavior and cognition. This is the three things I would like to talk uh, to you today. I would like to give you an overview of the center. I would like to talk to you about the setting in which the center, uh, the, the, the setting of the center, the organization of the center. I would like to talk about what is our mission uh, in the center and what is the impact <coughs> that we are having. Particularly with regard to the setting, I would like to talk about three things. Is what are the apes that we house, what are the facilities, and what is the structure of the, of the center. The center is a collaboration between the Leipzig Zoo and the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. The Max Planck Society is, so to speak, the parent company of our institute and has been very generous in funding this project. Our mission is to learn more about non-chimpanzees, and I repeat, we are very interested in chimpanzees, but we are also interested in the other great apes. In addition, we want to use this knowledge to make evolutionary inferences about the great apes, and that includes us. And in addition, we want to break new ground. We want to study things that nobody else has studied before. In terms of our impact, I will show you three things. I will show you what has been our scientific production in the last 10 years. The center opened in 2001. I will show you how we contribute to higher education and also public outreach. It is very important for us scientists to be able to communicate with the public in general. 
So let's start with the setting. So first of all, the species that we house are these. We have bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. And what you have here, these numbers, represent the number of males and the number of females that we currently have at the center. So for males and for females, in the chimpanzees, we have two groups of chimpanzees, one with six males, 11 females, and another one with one male and five females. We have a group of gorillas, and then we also have a group of orangutans with the numbers that you see on the screen. In addition, since the, the center opened in 2001, we've been very successful uh, uh, in breeding these different species. Uh, for the bonobos, three births, uh, the chimpanzees, seven. And by the way, the chimpanzees, some of the females are on birth control because otherwise, you know, we would run out of space very quickly. For the gorillas, three species, and for the orangutan, six. I mean, this is an outstanding number. There's been some years that the Leipzig has produced basically half of the orangutans of the European population. No, that is half of the orangutans born in Germany, which is different. So this is our field station, so to speak. And uh, this is the, the facilities. So the facilities are an indoor area and outdoor area. So this building is where, 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 where the apes are housed. And then they also have access to outdoor areas. So this, for instance, is, would be the, 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 um, the enclosure of, of the group, big group of chimpanzees. This is the gorillas. This is the bonobos. Here we would have the orangutans. And here would be the second group of chimpanzees. This is a view of the outdoor areas. This is, for instance, a gorilla you can see here. More up close and personal with the silverback in this group. The chimpanzees. The orangutans, this is all the outdoor areas. And as I said, we also have indoor areas. So when it's too cold in Leipzig, in the, in the winter months, it's very cold. So the subjects can stay inside. And this is the chimpanzee indoor area. This is the orangutan indoor area. And in addition, we have testing facilities, like the facilities that you can see here as well, and where we run some of the, the, the studies that we do. We also use the indoor and outdoor facilities that you saw a minute ago to do some of our studies. In these studies, one thing that is very important, think that the apes are never food deprived or water deprived, and participation is completely voluntary. It's up to them whether they want to um, participate in the task that we propose to them. And in addition, the public can watch uh, the, the, as, as the studies are being conducted. Now, in terms of what is the organization in terms of personnel, I already said that this is a collaboration between the Max Planck Institute and the Zoo of Leipzig. So we have parallel structures. The MPI, we have the, the, uh, the director of the center. In this case, that would be me. And then we have a lab coordinator. And then we have research assistants. This is the MPI structure. And it has a parallel at the zoo where we have a primate curator, a head keeper, and uh, 12 keepers for the whole facility. Our mission, three things we, we want to accomplish. The first one is we want to learn more about non-chimpanzees. And for instance, two things that we've known for a long time that chimpanzees are very good at is using tools and also using gestures. So during the time that we've been in Leipzig, we've been able to show that orangutans, gorillas, and bonobos can use tools as well. And they can use these tools uh, for uh, in, uh, in a context of planning. They can make tools, and they can use tools in sequence. They can use up to five different tools that they can use in sequence to obtain food. And in these studies, in these particular studies, we don't find big differences between the apes. I'll tell you one anecdote that I think is very telling. At the very beginning, when we started working with them, there was a period of habituation of them to us and us to them. And we were feeding the gorillas. And the gorillas are not very well known for being great tool users, right? So we, we had been feeding uh, the gorillas. And then after we had fed the gorillas, we sat there and we were watching them. And there was, there was a bucket with some food that was left over. We left it there. And then we just sat and observed them. And all of a sudden, you see this gorilla that goes into a different room and then comes back with a branch. And this we were watching, right? And uh, this brings the branch and then a long branch and then puts this branch into the bucket trying to get the food, right? Wow, 
Here you have the gorillas that were supposed not to use tools in front of our eyes were starting to use tools. So that was very exciting. In terms of gestures, again, chimpanzees using gestures, but then we have also studied the gestures of all the other species. Think about this. It is very important that we compare these species, and then we have um, studied their repertoires, how flexible they are when they use gestures, and what are the peculiarities of each species, because there are some differences that you can find. For instance, the chimpanzees, some of the gestures that they use involve drumming on the substrate, um, the, the gorillas as well, the orangutans that do that. The orangutans use other gestures, but the orangutans rarely drum. We use that knowledge to edit this volume together with Mike Tomasello, in which we put together all this knowledge that we had gained from Leipzig and from other places to try to bring together these different studies from the Great Apes. The second, the second goal is to make evolutionary inferences. Is we use this data to make evolutionary inferences. And very quickly, we study perspective taking, for instance, whether individuals know what other individuals can or cannot see. And here, this is a, a set of different studies in which if you put together all these data, what you see is that the ones that are more um, better, that perform better in this test overall, are the bonobos and the chimpanzees. The orangutans are the least. This is not to say that orangutans lack uh, perspective-taking abilities, but when you give them the hardest test, it is the chimpanzees and the bonobos, the ones that perform the best. We also have a study comparing individual, um, not individual differences, but species differences and, and sex differences. And one thing that we find is bonobo females are especially good at uh, tasks that involve um, social cognition, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting aspect. Another example to make evolutionary inferences, you can look at uh, when individuals are, try are trying to encode where food is located, food that is hidden, what kind of information they use. Well, we have observed that apes, in these kind of situations that we present them, use space, use spatial information. They know that the food is here or is there. This is the same thing that one-year-old children do. Space is very important for them. Now, when you give the same test to three-year-old children, what becomes more important than space is under what, in what container the food is located. So it's not whether it's here or there, it's what is the container that has the food? Is it the blue cup? Is it the green cup? Etc. So in, in, in humans, there seems to be a shift in preference from space, which is, if you look at all the data from the great apes, the primitive trait, so to speak, to shift to uh, this other trait that, um, that is not based on space, but on the features of the containers of the food. Obviously, that doesn't mean that apes cannot use features. Of course, they can. Uh, or that uh, three-year-old children lose their ability to, to use a spatial information. Of course they can use it. Simply we are talking about preferences. What is their preferred type of information? We make these evolutionary inferences because we are part of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. The A facility is a sub-department of the Department of Psychology that is led by Mike Tomasello. Within the institute, there are five other departments. Human evolution, linguistics, genetics, primatology, and psychology that I already mentioned. Each of them studies their own topic, but the common mission of all of them <coughs> is evolutionary anthropology. To throw some light in different aspects of, um, in different aspects of the behavior and the cognition of, uh, of humans. And for that, comparing with other species is absolutely crucial. Breaking new ground is also important. And uh, for instance, uh, just very briefly some examples. We have found that bonobos and orangutans can save tools for future use, and they will use these to get uh, a fruit that is outside of reach. For instance, if you give them tools that they, can, that they cannot use today, but they will be able to use tomorrow, what they will do is they will take those tools and they save them. They will take them into their sleeping room and put them there for tomorrow. Before we conducted this study, now this study has been replicated with chimpanzees. Before we conducted that study, I was very uh, skeptical that they would do this. 
and voila, it was very impressive to see these uh, orangutans and bonobos to take this tool for which at the moment they have no use for it. There is nothing they can do with it. Take it somewhere else, leave it there, and bring it the next day or after a few hours. This was very, very interesting. The, the work that we do is also um, aimed at connecting between disciplines. So this, for instance, have, has important implications for paleoanthropology and for theories of human evolution. Another, another topic that we have investigated is, for instance, chimpanzees behaving as rational maximizers. This is something Andy mentioned, that the, the issue of prosociality, and this also links with the issue of fairness. When individuals are sharing resources, do they do it in a fair way or not? And if they don't, what happens? Chimpanzees, for instance, humans, if you think about humans, if somebody gives you something that you think is unfair, you are capable of totally rejecting, so the person that made an unfair offer will not get anything. Chimpanzees are more practical. If you give them something that is above zero, they will take it. Because if you think about what humans do, it goes against what classical economic theory would predict. Because if you reject something that is in your hand, you're incurring a cost. The theory says you should not do this. Chimpanzees, it seems, know the theory. We don't. And this, of course, has uh, connections with, with um, experimental economics. And then another, 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 uh, another study that, that, uh, that has helped us advance this, the, the knowledge of the great apes is apes making inferences, causal inferences. There, was, there had been some study on inferences, but here we have, we have looked at whether they can make inferences that have to do with the relations between objects. Do they know how things work in the world? And yes, at some um, primary level, they do know. These are some findings. It's, uh, you don't have to read them, don't worry. Mm -hmm. It's a subset of findings, but I want to highlight two. So we study technical cognition and social cognition, and the first one I want to highlight is this. We found, Amanda C. found, that is here. Amanda has been in Leipzig um, um, working there. Uh, tool use imposes a cognitive load that masks chimpanzees' causal knowledge. That is, if you want to study causal knowledge, be very careful how you choose the task. Because by asking them to do something extra, that for us may seem trivial, like using a tool, that may make them not be able to solve the problem that, that, that you pose them. So that's one thing. The other, the other study that I would like to highlight is one that Katie did also in Leipzig. And in that study, Katie found that chimpanzees extract social information from agonistic screams. We really like to have these collaborations. Amanda has been there for, for, for she was there uh, during his, her postdoctoral work. Uh, Katie was visiting. But I think it's very important that we collaborate between different institutions. I mean, comparative psychology cannot go into the 21st century by us working in an isolated manner. We are not going to get anywhere. What is our impact? Don't worry, nothing is going to explode. <laughs> it's just an image. OK, let's talk about scientific production. Remember, this is the problem that we face. Chimpanzees are leading the way chimpanzees are, um, are um, taking about 70% of the studies. This is, if you look at from 1978 to 2001, to the survey that we did, chimpanzee studies were about 70%. If you look at all the ape studies that had been done, you look at all the labs and published in these in this, in this, uh, journals, 70% of the studies that you would find on ape cognition are chimpanzee studies. If you look from 2003 to 2007, the thing has changed a little bit. Still chimpanzees predominate. But there's been what I think is a substantial change. So that's good, because it seems the field is starting to balance somehow. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I think we are getting there. In addition, if we look at all labs, and this is, this is I think, a very important slide, is you, this is the number of studies, the percent of studies that involve one species, two species, three species, or four species of grade A. Look at Right? Basically, no studies with the four great apes published in those journals 
until 2003. This part that you see here, this is our impact. Those studies are Leipzig studies. And we cannot do this alone, because one could say, well, this is study about chimpanzee differences or, or, or angutan or bonobos, but we need other places doing some of the same work because what we are attributing to species differences could be group differences. That's another reason why it's important that we um, do this together. Now this is Leipzig. This is the, the studies that we published. The, the center opened 2001. And then at first we were you know, getting used to the setup. And now I think we reach our, our cruising speed so to speak, this is the, the cumulative number of papers that we have published based on Leipzig data. If you look at the disciplines, the main discipline is comparative psychology, <coughs> then cognitive development, then you have a category of general, general type of journals, then you have animal behavior, primatology, and anthropology. There is an interesting thing in this slide, and is we are primatologists. And look, whoops, look, where we are publishing very little in primatology journals. Why we are doing that? We are doing it on purpose. Because we think it's important that primatologists put their work out there for other scientists to see it. Comparative psychology, developmental psychology, and cognition. We continue to publish in primatology, but we want primatology to be more integrated within the field. These are the journals. If you are curious about uh, the different, uh, the different, the number of papers in different journals, as you can see, these two are comparative psychology journals. This is cognition or uh, developmental psychology, uh, cognitive psychology, developmental, etc. You can see what the spread of the different journals. What do we do for higher education? Uh, we have students. And, and, uh, and uh, the students are there uh, testing the apes, getting their degrees. And this is, for instance, our researchers in 2012, just 2012. Uh, here you have the number of postdocs, doctoral students, master students, interns, guests, and high school students. When we have high school students that are interested, we don't say, no, you cannot come, you have to go to the university. No, we say, come, and you can help us. We cannot take every high, every high school student, but when they are young, interested people, we need to support them. Interns, for instance, you see we have about 12 interns for 2012. Just for interns, I looked and last year I think we got something like 50 applications. Just for interns. These are our postgraduate students, and you can see their origin. Most of them originate uh, from Germany. We are based in Germany, and then we have the US, the UK, Spain, Canada, etc. So one thing that I would show with this slide is that we are attracting a variety of people, which I think is a very good thing because um, the, 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 the institute and the aid facility are a very international uh, place to be. Public outreach. This, we do guided tours, and when, when um, uh, groups of people are interested in seeing the facility, um, we offer them guided tours, and you can see here it's been a steadily increasing, and uh, you can see the different types of tours that we do, students and professors, those are mostly university students, pupils and teachers, primary, secondary school, high school, guests that come to the institute, we also uh, give tours for that, either individuals, particular individuals or groups of individuals, kindergartens also, and other organizations. Uh, recently we had a request from an organization of uh, vegetarians, they wanted to see the ape house. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> media coverage, we get a substantial amount of media attention, and here you have for print, radio, and TV. These are um, people that come to Leipzig and visit us. Here I didn't count those that talk to us on the phone and that we email. This is the kind of, uh, the, the number of uh, interviews or filming, etc. that we see in Leipzig. You will recognize some of these channels. So the BBC has been there a number of times, National Geographic TV, Discovery Channel, etc. 
uh, many German channels, there are lots of channels in German TV and also TV from Spain, from Korea, uh, Sweden, Croatia, etc. Why has this happened? In a sense, what I'm going to say will not surprise you because it's very simple, it's a very simple equation. Create a unique resource. Create a unique resource that has, in this case, species, facilities, and personnel. Something that is unique. What that will do is will attract talent. So you will get faculty wanting to come and work there. Those faculty will bring students, and the students will also be interested, so they will come in. And those two, what they will do as well, they will bring external funding. <coughs> In addition, that's from the point of view of the Max Planck Institute, that's the scientific part. But there's also what's, what's in for the zoo, so to speak. Well, when you have something like that, the media want to see it, the media will tell people, and the visitors will want to see it. People want to see what they've seen on TV, so they will come to see it. And when the visitors are there, the next ones to come are the sponsors. Since there are many people there, you know, it's good to be there as well. This is a very simple recipe, right? But I think, when I think how come this could happen, this is what I can come up with. Uh, provide something unique, something that nobody else has, something that can do something good for science, and then the rest will fall into place. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.